The Bible uh, talks a lot about God's plan for people, for us, right? It talks about his desire to participate with all of us, with his people, to make the world a good and beautiful and life-giving place. I mean, that's what the Christmas season, you know, that's what we talk about. That's what every song on the radio is about. That's what all of the Hallmark movies are about. I mean, it's about this, this better picture of the world, you know? But unfortunately, then we leave, you know, the Hallmark station. Then we leave church and we go to work and we get on the road and we go shopping with all of the crazy people who are out there. And we realize that the choices that we make and the choices that other people make don't cause a good, beautiful, loving, hopeful world as much as they often cause frustration, right? And, and we see all of the stuff going on in the world. We see people make poor choices. We, people seek pleasure no matter what the cost and who it hurts. Um, we want to control everything. And as a people, it seems like we have this tendency to exploit everything that is good. And then on top of that, so many of us have grown up with this picture of God that's like, you know, because you reject me, I reject you. I, am, I enjoy punishing you. And that is like, a God that all of us reject because it's a caricature. That's not what God is like. It's actually the exact opposite of that. And that's what these Christmas prophecies are all about. These Christmas prophecies are about a God who is not like, you will be condemned. It's actually a God that says, you have messed so much up. I still plan to come and help you. I still plan to come in the midst of all of that. I still am here for you. That's what these prophecies are about. And so in a broken world full of suffering, the world that we see every day, what we'll see in these prophecies is this promise, this Advent promise of hope and peace and joy and love. They are in here. And so that's what, that's what Christmas is all about. So let me start this message by reading one of the Christmas prophecies from the Gospel of Matthew. So this is the fulfillment of, of the prophecy, and, and you're very familiar with this story. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And then when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, <clears throat> and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where, where is this Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, I want to give you a little bit of reference because Bethlehem, excuse me, is only about six miles south of Jerusalem. And I kind of put a map of like modern day and in the Roman, in the ancient time when Jesus was born. And um, now Bethlehem is a pretty good sized town. It's in the Palestinian territory. It's, it's almost completely Muslim. It's about, uh, I mean, completely Arab. It's about half Muslim, half Christian, and it is a, a bustling town. Back when Jesus was born, though, it was really small. It was insignificant. See, let's just say that back then you could not grab a Stars and Bucks coffee like you can today. This picture is from Bethlehem. They should be sued. <laughs> Talk about being able to utilize. Now, what's really funny is all over Israel, Stars and Bucks Cafe is everywhere. And it's not owned by Starbucks. It just cracks me up. Anyway. Um, so last week I mentioned that prophecy always has two meanings. You know, it has the meaning for the original audience and it has a meaning for after its fulfillment. And, um, when in the, in that immediate situation when, uh, which I spent a lot of time on last week, you know, when it had a message to those people, often those people didn't even realize they were hearing prophecy that was going to be fulfilled in the future. They, they didn't know that until later when they were, you know, they had gone through history and they were looking back and they went, oh my goodness, the prophet said this, we thought it meant something, but 
everything he said happened exactly the way he said it, but nobody would have expected it that way. I mean, it's like, that's what he was saying. We were wondering throughout history what Isaiah or Micah was saying, but once it happens, they look back and went, oh, that's what he meant. So when the the prophet Micah prophesied about Bethlehem, he said, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So they read this passage back then and they were like, okay, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And, and, and then they said, okay, and by the way, Ephrathah is a word that basically just kind of like helps them know which Bethlehem they were talking about. This was the Bethlehem in Judah. That's what Ephrathah means. And so then they look at the rest and they go, it is one who will be a ruler over Israel. And th- oh, so the Messiah is going to come and be a warrior and he will conquer all of Israel's enemies and he will lead us. He will lead the people. And then, you know, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Yes, this is going to be a Messiah who is from the ancient line of David. And so they would pray for hundreds of years, oh, Messiah, come. Messiah, come. And then they, they suffered through Assyrian pr- oppression. And then they suffered through Babylonian oppression and Persian oppression and Greek oppression. And then finally in the days of Jesus, it was Roman oppression. Hundreds of years, lots of suffering. Oh, Messiah, please come. See, throughout their history, I mean, they had little freedom. They had no control over their lives. The tax burden on them was huge. That's why Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem in the first place, because of taxes. See, what's really interesting to me, you know, in history, or or later on, looking back at those hundreds of years of history, is that the situation that Mary and Joseph and the Israel and the Jews were all in, the oppression that they were suffering, was a, a direct result of the disobedience of their ancestors who were first given this prophecy. They disobeyed, and and I'm not going to go into it in a lot of ways, but I think what we see by the fact that hundreds of years were dealt with because of disobedience in the 700s BC shows us that what we do matters for generations. The kind of people that we become really does make a difference in people's lives. The, the, The choices that we make change the trajectory, not just of our lives, but of the lives who come after us, the people who will follow us, that if we knew them, we would love them because they're they're related to us. Yet they will live long after we are, but they're going to deal with the consequences, good and bad, of our choices today. See, what we do matters for generations. And and last week, you know, I I spent a lot of time, a lot of time, I I hear, uh, on Ahaz and King Ahaz of Judah, where he disobeyed God and he... Instead of of seeking help from God, he went to the evil empire of Assyria, the barbaric people, and asked for help. And so they helped, but it came at a cost. Because when Ahaz died, excuse me, his, uh, his son Hezekiah inherited this kingdom of Judah. That was just a fraction of what it had been before. I mean, these people were in, they were so in debt to the empire of Assyria that all wealth that they accumulated immediately went back to Assyria, all of it. The soldiers, the Assyrian soldiers, they, they would pillage and take whatever they wanted from people. The northern kingdom was wiped out. I mean, because, you know, the southern kingdom, Ahaz goes to Assyria, says, they're hurting me, Ahaz. So he goes and wipes them out. Tens of thousands of people, of fellow Israelites, mind you, were killed. And orphans and widows, all these refugees started pouring into the southern kingdom. And these refugees, they were homeless They were walking, they had nothing. They had lost their fathers and their sons. And right there in the middle of the streets, they were being robbed of anything that they had left by their fellow Israelites. It's an abhorrent situation that we just go, I can't even fathom robbing the homeless refugees who just lost all of their family as they're coming down. See, injustice was so rampant and nobody was standing up for these helpless people. It is in that situation that this prophecy was given. 
the prophet Micah was sent by God to the, Judah, to the Judeans and said, what are you doing? Stop this. You are, you are committing evil, sinful, bad choices. You are hurting people. Stop your selfish and evil ways. See, what Micah was stressing was that God always was and is on the side of the poor, the weak, the helpless, the needy. Those are his people. And if we, as you know, we being, I'm talking about to the people Micah's talking to, if we are taking advantage of those people, if we are exploiting those people, God wants the exploiters to know you are going against God. Stop. And if you don't, God, through Micah, had said, I will take away any protection from those who would inflict harm. I will, you will have to suffer the consequences of your choices. So Micah prophesied that those who were causing the injustice, they would be completely emptied of their resources. He said, Assyria is going to wipe you out clean. There's going to be nothing left. You were then going to be exiled by Babylon, and you were going to suffer terribly. Now, in this room, you might be thinking, well, thank you, Don. Merry Christmas. <laughs> that is a great message. Appreciate the joy and the hope. What about baby Jesus? You know, that's the point of this prophecy. Because see, and this is the good stuff to me, in the midst of the suffering that the evil people those who are causing injustice, in the midst of their suffering that, that is a result of their own choices, God promises hope. In the midst, God promised that he would always remain faithful. He reaffirmed his love for the world, not just for the people who say yes to him and for the people who follow him. He reaffirmed in these prophe this prophecy his love for the world. The consequences of their bad choices, yes, they would be de devastating. But God was saying, it will not destroy you. God promised he would rescue them. He promised that he would bring his Messiah out of Bethlehem to defeat the enemy and usher in the kingdom. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me. From, for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins from, are from old, from ancient times. And they had no idea how old <laughs> and ancient these times would be that this Messiah would come from. Micah continues, though, the next, next two verses. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned, which happened, until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. And the rest of his, his brothers return to join the Israelites. And he, this Messiah, will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they, think about an oppressed people hearing these words. And they will live securely, something that they have never experienced. They will live securely for then his greatness, God's greatness, the greatness of the Messiah will reach to the ends of of the earth. And so what happened is for the next 700 years after this prophecy, the Israelites suffered. The Jewish people suffered. And they clung to this hope that Messiah would come and conquer the enemy and bring back the glory days of David's kingdom. And see, that's why when King Herod heard this, that the baby had been born, that this king of the Jews that had been prophesied about was born, that's why he was disturbed. He was Rome's appointed king in Judea. He was the oppressive ruler that Messiah would overthrow. And Herod was not about to let that happen. So when he heard that the Messiah, that this king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, what did he do? He had all the babies in Bethlehem slaughtered. All of them. See, like all of the Jews, Herod misunderstood he didn't realize that Messiah was going to bring peace not through victory and conquering, not through wiping out a people. No, he was going to bring victory through sacrifice, sacrificing his own life. Messiah was very different than any of anybody expected. See, Herod believed he could thwart God's plan. But Mary and Joseph, as you know and I know, because we know the rest of the story, 
had already left with Jesus for Egypt. See, no matter how much control we think we have, God's overall plan will not be deterred. And that is a beautiful thing. His plan for the world is a plan of love and joy and hope and peace and healing and wholeness. His plan is to allow people, you and me, I mean, as messed up as all of us are, and and if you're not messed up, then I am envious of you, but I'm messed up, and as messed up as all of us are, God wants us to participate with him in making his kingdom come on earth, his will to be done right here on earth. But see, here's the freedom. Each of us has a choice. Do Do we choose that plan? Do we choose to participate with him, or do we not? We can do our own thing, and most of us do. I mean, we look around the world, and most of us do our own thing, and we miss the most amazing, epic, greatest journey that has ever been offered humanity because we want our own thing, and we all do. We get mad when we suffer the consequences. We do. You know, it's Christmas time. We buy more than we can afford. And then we get so angry at the credit card bills that come in and the financial stress. We, 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 we date unwisely, we'll sleep around, and then we wonder, why can't any of my relationships work? Kids, you know, we'll open up a billion presents on Sunday, on, on Sunday morning. It's Monday. On, on Christmas morning, and um, after all the presents are open, we're like, I'm bored. And, you're, and as a parent, you're thinking, how is this possible that this kid just opened up a million presents and they're bored, but they're just not satisfied? And then the worst thing is that, you know, you, you buy your, your young kid all this stuff and they just want to play with the box. And you're like, what is that about? It's a box. Why didn't I get him a bunch of boxes? I know. I know. I'm sorry I'm done ranting, but that one, it was really sad. If it's a big box, then I'm in it with them. And, you know, and, and my wife's like, oh. anyway. See, we can get, because of our choices and because of the consequences of our choices, we can get so upset and so frustrated. We, our tempers will get short. We'll be mad at everybody. Sometimes we doubt God. Just get mad at him. Please tell me, I'm not the only one like this, all right? Is, is there other, is anybody shake your head yes if, if I'm, what I'm saying? Okay, good. There's at least three of us, and we are a mess. I, I wanted to share a story, a, a personal story about this, because it was before Ray Lynn and I um, got married, and um, I lost control because the world seemed to be falling apart. Everything was crashing, and I was completely out of control. And um, this was about a year after my, my wife, which I had shared with you before, uh, right when I got here. So if you don't know, <laughs> my wife passed away when I was about 22, my first wife. And we'd been married about two years. And this was about a year after her passing. I, had gra- I graduated from college about six weeks after she passed away, and I had a religion degree. But I wasn't even sure God existed anymore. And I will tell you, if you have a bachelor's degree in religion and don't know if God exists, there are not a lot of jobs for you. (laughs) So um, I, and I'm just being serious, I had never been poorer in my entire life. I was living with every friend because I just, (laughs) I I couldn't get a job. And so um, what I decided is that I was going to go back to college and work on a pre-med degree. Thought maybe I could be a good eye doctor or something. And so for the next year, I took a bunch of sciences and maths to get this pre-med degree. And um, I had applied to a state university to finish. And um, when I had applied to that state university, it's like nothing, nothing went right. Um, my My transcripts were all messed up. And so I had to, like, it took days to clear this up. The class that I needed to finish this pre-med degree so that I could go to eye doctor school was almost about to close. The deadline was, was cl- close. It was fast approaching, and I was in a panic because all of this stuff was still a mess. And I remember I was living with my dad at the time, and I was pacing in his kitchen back and forth on the phone and um, just talking to registrar at the university, trying to figure out what was going wrong and why, why this wasn't working. I mean, I was so upset because nobody was like, nobody was could fix the problem, and I was freaking out. And um, a friend once told me, by the way, this is really good. If, if you ignore everything I've said today, this one, this is a good one, because I didn't make it up. A friend told me that people are a lot like jelly donuts. 
See, when you squeeze them hard enough, what's on the inside squirts out. And what became obvious is that what was on my insides was not pretty. Because what squirted out was venom and was anger. I was so upset. I was on that phone with that lady. And, uh, and you know, she kept putting me on hold. I'd done everything I needed to do to get this thing to work. And nothing was working. And so I raised my voice. I was tense. And I was a jerk to her. No matter how hard I pushed, this was out of my control. And I was mad. And then she put me on hold again for a long time. And I remember, I just got to that point. I sat down and I just started crying. I started weeping because I did, what could I do? I felt so alone. I felt so like there was nobody on my team that nobody cared about me. I mean, I, I was at the end. I, 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 did, I just hung up the phone and I just sat in that chair sobbing. I was at the end of my rope. I remember this day so vividly because it was, it was the, it's like one of those few defining moments in my life. I, I did the only thing I could possibly do in that moment. I dumped it all at God's feet. It's the only thing I could do. I remember I just started pl- praying. And, and my prayer was different than it had ever been before, even before my, my wife had passed away, because my prayer was not, God, bless my plan. My prayer was, God, I'm at the end. I have no plan. Give me your plan. Whatever that is. I don't know. Doctor, you know, doesn't matter. Beach cleanup person, it doesn't matter. Give me your plan because I'm at the end. I surrender. I'd been away for a long time and I wanted to come back. See, I didn't understand why God let my wife die. And that always had bugged me. I mean, could, was he a God who could be trusted? Was he a God who even existed? I doubted so deeply But in that moment, I told him, I'm going to try to trust you to the best of my ability. I I have very little, God, but it's yours. I'm going to do the best I can. And you know what? Like he always does, he accepted me right then just as I am. I didn't have to run through a hundred hoops. I wish I could say he he came down and just said, Don, (laughs) and grabbed my hand. He didn't. It was a long, long journey that lasted well into my marriage to Ray Lynn before I would, I, I would say I was, I was fairly well healed from all of that brokenness, all of that doubt. But see, in that moment when I just said, I surrender, the direction of my life changed right then. If you're new to this church thing or you're visiting, sometimes you might see in a song people raise their hands and you just go, that's weird. That's weird. I remember feeling that way when I first started going to church. And I had this old guy who... Um, he just, for whatever reason, always said hi to me when I started visiting church. And as we got talking one day, he said, do you know why people raise their hands when they, they worship? And I was like, no. <laughs> it kind of freaks me out, as a matter of fact. He says, well, when you, when you want to tell somebody that you surrender, what do you do? You raise your hands. And he said, for many of those people, all they're doing is saying, God, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. And from that moment on, it stopped being weird. I never was really a hand raiser, but I appreciate it so deeply. And it was years later at that moment in my dad's kitchen when I was like, I surrender. That moment changed everything because I chose God and it definitely put a different trajectory to my life. But I could have gone the other way. God God allows it. I could have done whatever. I could have kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing, kept being mean, kept being venomous. And it would have led to frustration and emptiness just like it always does. See, when we do it our own way, even if we accomplish our goals, you know this, we all have been here. Even if you accomplish your goals, sometimes it it just feels empty later on. Maybe in the moment you're like, woo, this is the greatest thing. I remember a Super Bowl. I wish I could remember who it was, but there was this the star who won the Super Bowl said it was the greatest night of his life. And like two weeks later, he said, I feel emptier than I've ever felt in my life. And you're like, how is that possible? You just won the Super Bowl. Doesn't matter. It, even when we reach our goals, when it's just on us, it comes up empty. No matter how far we go, no matter, no matter how far we go, though, no matter how stupid we act, God always wants to invite us back. He always is inviting us back. So that's the story of the prodigal son. He's always looking for us. He's always waiting, 
waiting. And he will always run to us every time. That is the promise of Micah. While God condemned what all of those people were doing to each other, the evil deeds and all of that, he promised a day. One day, all will be made right. One day, it's all going to come. Peace will reign one day. And in that, they were given hope. And in that, we are given hope. Because no matter how small or insignificant we think we are, no matter how broken or weak, no matter how the addictions that we have fallen to just seem like we can't get rid of them, no matter how bad it gets, we can know God's plan includes us. It includes us. It includes you. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad it is, no matter how empty you feel, no matter how many people in your life have rejected you, God's plan includes you and me. And all he asks us to do is choose him. Just surrender. Oh, I can't do it anymore. I follow you. So, you know, for 700 years, the people waited. They didn't know when Messiah would come. They didn't know anything about what it would look like. But when Jesus was born on that Christmas morning, suddenly everything came into focus. It is so much easier to trust when you've already seen God do something great and you already know how, how, how the ending is than it is when you're still on this side of the promise. You know, when the promise is just a promise, it's so hard to trust sometimes. I mean, I think that's why we doubt God when we see all the suffering in the world because even though he says one day there will be peace, one day there is hope, it hasn't happened yet. It, it's not been fully realized. And so we go, I don't know if I can trust that promise. I don't know. See, that's why I think that we are given the promises like from Micah. See, when these Christmas promises, they show us that God was working in the past and they help us trust the promises that are yet to be fulfilled. This is a big deal. Think about it. I mean, we are so much better off than the people who received those first promises because they never got to see Jesus born. It says in, the, in, in Hebrews that, the prophets and the, the teachers from the Old Testament days, they longed to see the fulfillment. And then it happened. Jesus was born. Yet we realize, oh, it looks so different than what anybody expected. He's not going to come and conquer. He's going to come and die? What is that? Jesus died promising that one day, like it's like the kingdom has come in Jesus. But then he died and he rose again and he said, and one day I will return, and that will be the full you know, realization of the kingdom. And you're like, oh, I've got to wait more. Ah! Oh. <laughs> but we can look back at these promises that he's been given you know, to Micah and Isaiah and go, this is what it's going to be like. And then, boom, 700 years later, it is exactly what they said, but just nobody expected it to look that way. It was so different than what they expected, but it's exactly what they said. I think that gives us confidence and trust. I think that's why they're included in the scriptures because we can go, God was at work back then and we saw it come to, come to fruition. Okay, he's still saying some more things about our future. Hmm. It's hard to trust, but I can look back and go, he was faithful, 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 faithful. Okay, I'm going to trust that he's faithful again. I think that's the reason for these prophecies. And I think that's why we now get to sing songs about the little town of Bethlehem, remembering God's fulfillment of the ancient promises. Knowing that one day, one day all will be made right, all will be whole, but until that day, God, you, can, you know I keep coming back to this, but until that day, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It hasn't happened yet. Use me to be part of that. Use my church. Like, and when I say my church, I don't mean as leader. I mean like use my family. Use my family. I'm a part of this family. Use my family to accomplish your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Oh Lord, until that day, use us to bring peace and hope and joy and love to a broken world that people might fall in love with you that they might choose you so that the brokenness is healed. But the choice is yours and mine. So here's my question for you. All of that to say, this Christmas season, 
I know it's a fast-paced world. I know that, uh, I mean, it's December, what, third today? I'm like, <laughs> I've been here for six months. Se- um, seven months? <laughs> I'm in my seventh month here. I feel like I came a month ago. Time is flying. So it's easy to just get wrapped up in the going, going, going. So in this season, will you choose once again to follow Jesus? Whether you have chosen him in the past or this is new to you, he invi- he's inviting you, follow me. Follow me. Let's, I want to participate with you to do something incredible in this world. Will you choose him? Or will it just be another year of us doing our own thing, our own way? Which one do you choose? It's hard. It's daily. You don't get to choose once and it's always chosen. I'm finding some days I have to choose every day. There are days I have to choose every hour. No, 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 Don, you're not getting your own way. I'm going to follow Jesus. Sometimes it happens, it has to happen all the time. What do you choose? Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, I am so, so grateful for the prophecies about your birth. And I am so grateful that you came not as this violent warrior, but you came in love to sacrifice your life for me and for all people. Oh, God, help me to choose you. Help me to choose selflessness instead of selfishness. Help me to to choose to be your hands and feet, to bring your kingdom to earth, to, to have your will be done on earth. I pray that for our church. God, I pray that, that this body will be your hands and feet in this community. And God, I know in a crowd this size, there are people who are probably like, I have not heard a message like this. I, I, and maybe they're even feeling this tug inside that you're, you're, you're inviting them to follow you. I pray that you give them the courage and the faith and the strength to just put their hands up and say, I surrender. I want to follow Jesus. God, that is your will, that we are followers who you are making whole. I pray, God, that we will always keep that as the, in the forefront of how we live so that we can give you glory, so that we can exist for your purposes because those purposes are beautiful. In your name we pray. Amen.